you're in business, you have to start at the bottom in a way to learn the ropes. And you see people coming out of university and they don't have any work ethic. They've never been there. They don't understand how the average person thinks and lives. I did it. I worked in the shop for years. I played football at Hackney Marshes with people who dug up the roads. I feel that that has done me a lot of good because I'm down to earth. I can relate with people. I can, when I talk to them, I can understand. I'm not in some ivory tower. Welcome, welcome, welcome to this another episode of Pints of You. So Gary Goldsmith here in the Cavendish in Marlebone with one of my old chums where we're going to talk about life, business and stuff. Uh, today I'm delighted to be joined by the legend that is Gerald Ratner. Um, should we have a little clap for Gerald? Brilliant. Now Gerald, I will come back and introduce you more formally, but if it's all right, I've written you a poem because, because I'm a little bit gangster. Um, so I think this sums up the story quite well, but you can be the judge. Gerald Ratner, a name known far and wide, millions of rings did he sell to British brides. In the realm of business, of visionary mind, his story unfolds a tale of a kind, where ambition grew and success verified height. Gerald's empire soared, a shining light. With charm and wit, he built many brands, a story that captivated the entire land. Lessons learned, a humble in turn. Gerald's words caused the city to burn. <laughs> Love that bit. From riches to rags, he faced the fall, yet resilience and a strong wife, he stood tall. So let us gather and respect and awe, Gerald Ratner, a phoenix we saw. A testament to human spirit, strength, his journey inspires a tale that is immense. Gerald sparkled in Ibiza with his story and charisma. She horned that one in, so forgive. A pirate favourite, and boy what a legend, Mr. Bounce Back, Mr. Bounce Back, who knows where his story will end. So, your story to unfold. I'll shut up now, Gerald. How did I do, Gerald, mate? I think you <laughs> summed it up pretty well. That's, yeah, that's thank pretty, you. My pleasure. Thank you very much. To be fair, that was a long one. That's a long one to be getting out on this, this uh, wet, rainy I, I love the fact as well you decided to go for words that didn't rhyme. So that was they, they that, did. that was lovely. Can I say they did when I wrote it? <laughs> they didn't when you said them. <laughs> Okay, so, um, so let me just do a proper introduction. So um, Gerald is the man who pretty much ran retail across the 1980s. Um, what you don't know, I think the stat was nine out of every 10 pieces of jewellery that was sold during the, those heady um, Thatcher days was to a business that you owned. You uh, literally did own the high street. Um, a, a darling to the city, um, totally fantastic in terms of what he did, and everybody was looking with awe. Uh, there was one moment in time. Um, so when we look back at what advice you might give your 18-year-old self, I have a guess what we might be talking about. But um, there's lots of things to, to, to talk about. So firstly, thank you for making it here. I uh, really appreciate you giving up the time. You're very generous to the Pirates for, for doing things like this. Um, we're a big fan, and hopefully you'll get some of the insights. So, Gerald, thank you and welcome. It's a pleasure. Thanks for asking me, Gary. Always. So, um, one of the things that I really wanted to talk about was how on earth your story unfolded where you owned the high street, where, you know, pretty much every other brand... I work for you. I work for... <laughs> I, I didn't know, so, know that. Yeah, so... I keep meeting people that work for me. They keep coming up and saying... I, work. I mean, I did employ 27,000 people, more than the Royal Navy. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff. How did that all come about? How did you become the jewellery man? Well, it was a family business that wasn't doing very well, losing money. <clears throat> and uh, we had this buyer called Terry uh, who was had the common touch, if you like. And when he was working for us in the early days, that we did very well. But he left and he had a row with my father, whose business it was. And when I took over the company, as I say, it was losing about £34,000, I felt that the way Terry had started up on his own, he was our buyer, and, and he was doing very well, doing stuff uh, very cheaply. And the demographics were such in the early 80s that it was the young people that had the money, disposable income, that they would buy everything on impulse. 
yuppie generation. Yeah, but they wouldn't buy jewellery because it was too expensive. And all the jewellers, ourselves, H. Samuel, Ernest Jones, Sales, had a view that you had to be very, very prestigious um, to entice people into your shop. But in fact, the opposite was true because of the threshold barrier of young people. They felt if they were going into a jeweler's shop, they were going to get stung uh, because it was so expensive and nothing was priced. So Terry uh, had the opposite view and he was a very down to earth sort of bloke. He used to go to Butlins for his holidays and he knew what the British public could afford and what they'd buy. And, and when he started up on his own, uh, his prices were very low. So I felt clearly sometimes the best ideas are somebody else's, so you copy them. And I clearly saw that he was doing things the right way, albeit in a very small way. So I went down that track of uh, selling stuff like cheaper earrings, chains, uh, watches under £10, instead of the expensive diamond rings and wedding rings and stuff like that. And I put posters on the windows and played pop music and got, away, got rid of the doors and all that sort of stuff and really brought it down market, if you like, accessible. And I made a lot of enemies doing that because they said you ruined the whole image of the jewellery business. But it was phenomenally successful. Were you, were you buying your materials? Were you buying your product from the same people? No, completely different. Um, the, the people that were selling us earrings, for instance, the weight of those earrings in gold was ridiculous, made it ridiculously expensive. So what we did is from the Far East, we developed uh, earrings that were so light that we actually had a plastic tube inside the hoop earring. And they were so light that they didn't, you only have to hallmark something if it's over a gram in weight. And these earrings are so light, fly away, that they didn't even, they weren't even a gram, so they didn't even have to hallmark. So we developed a way of producing jewelry at a much cheaper price because people were not buying jewellery as an investment. They were buying it as a fashion. Fashion, fashion yeah. exactly. So it worked phenomenally well. Um, what was the split of the costume jewellery versus... N none of it was, it was all end. real jewellery. That was the clear thing. We, right. we wanted to tell people that this is not costume jewellery, this is the real stuff, but at a much lower price. So in instead of an average ticket price of 200 quid, it was an average ticket price of about 10 or 15 quid. It's a massive difference. But and you got the footfall. We got massive footfall. Uh, we had queues outside. I remember going up to Liverpool and it was like a football crowd out there. They, everyone was buying that stuff for their uh, Christmas presents because it was, you know, it was nice. It was fashionable. It looked good. And as jewellery doesn't have a, res a big resale value anyway, unless it's very expensive, it didn't really matter. And that hit our competitors enormously because they weren't going into the H. Samuels and the Ernest Jones. Uh, they, which they were four deep in that shop at Christmas at Collingwood. And, yeah. they were, they were, and it was just, and I, that was my Saturday job. Right. Um, and it was just dealing with people, trying to upsell, yeah. in and out, bish, bash, bosh. And I remember writing down the codes because the last bit of the codes yeah. told you what the percentage of park cut was. It's like, right. there's, there's a margin in jewellery. Yeah, the, the profit margin's enormous in jewellery. I'm, I'm sorry that we lost you, Gary. <laughs> we could have made you a manager. <laughs> Gary Goldsmith. In well, area manager. Yeah, yeah. Well, one day, yeah. yeah. yeah, but, yeah but it, was, it was a great starting point. But, you know, fair. it's strange that I meet a lot of very, very successful people like you who are running big businesses. And they've turned around and they said they used to work for me. There's another guy who started Dreams, Mike Clare, uh, sold his business for 300 million pounds. He used to work for me and he said, I work for you in the High Wycombe shop. So a lot of people have made a lot more successful than I am that used to work for me. Hardly. Should we go on to the, yeah. the, so, um, the clever idea was to own the high street. So when the other chains weren't doing well, you were sitting there and you basically, how many brands did you have in the end? Well, we had Watches of Switzerland, we had H. Samuel, we had Ernest Jones, we had Zales, we had Leslie Davis, uh, we had uh, even non jewelry Salisbury's. Um, and then and we'll of course, we had a thousand shops in America as well. We were one of the few retailers to succeed on the other side of the Atlantic. With the same formula? No, that was the key. Uh, everybody uses the same formula to when they go to another country and it's always a mistake because even though they speak the same language uh, totally different market 
a totally different way of buying things, much more receptive to the hard sell in America than they are in the UK. If you start, if you take anything from here to America, you'll screw up. So we, we bought local management and expanded their business. I, I'm going to come back to that because yeah. that's really important. H- how did you manage? So, so you're basically really hurting some brands on the higher street and yeah. then you've gone to try and buy them. That, that, that must have been a frosty It was reception. very difficult. It was a very frosty reception. And there was um, H. Samuel was the big one uh, because they had 450 shops. I'd now grown to 150 shops, uh, but they were their shops were much bigger than ours. They were in better locations. Uh, they had a better name. They were the they were the Britain's largest, uh, best known jewelers. And I wanted to buy them. The problem was that the family owned over 50 percent, so a lot of people were trying to buy them because they were a property play. They actually owned, which is ridiculous. They owned. In those days when shops were out in the high street, a lot of them, they owned the freeholds. They weren't even paying rent. But they were still not making much of a profit, which was unbelievable when they're not paying rent. just shows you how badly they were run and how badly we hit them. So uh, even though he had over 50% of the the shares, he was a public company. And even though the shareholders couldn't do anything about it, he was becoming more and more unpopular because he said, why can't you do what Ratners are doing? you're being hit left, right and centre. So in the end, I went to see him uh, and I said, uh, we should merge. I thought that was a good opening line rather than I should buy you out. But he just threw threw two fingers at me. I went away. Uh, But then I planted an article in the Daily Telegraph saying that uh, H. Samuel should sell to Ratners because they have no management. And the strange thing is that his mother phoned me up and she said... Stop picking on my boy. (laughs) <laughs> no, exactly the opposite. She says that Anthony shouldn't be running it. You're absolutely right. He's an idiot. And I, I, you know, sometimes you just cannot believe the fo- a phone call that you get. That your so her mother would say. She, so anyway, she sold me. She couldn't sell me Anthony's shares, her sons, but she could sell me her twenty-seven percent. Uh, so I bought her 20%, 7% of the shares. I then went back to Anthony and I said, we should really do a merger. You can be the chairman. I'll be the chief executive. We can call it H. Samuels. I don't mind. And I gave in to every single thing because I just wanted that deal. Yeah. I made every concession. I spent time with him. I was really nice to him. And then I fired him. Uh, so that was uh, not very nice from my point of view, but it was the only way that I could do it. And I, I had to take legal advice because you couldn't fire him on day one because he could have sued you. You had to work with him for three months, which was a nightmare. Um, but I worked with him for three months and then got legal advice and fired him. And did you get his shares at that time? Yeah, well, because we, we bought the company. Yeah, right. it was a it was a, the acquisition. He agreed to the acquisition oh. on the basis that he was the chairman. And I was the chief executive. So I'd already bought the business. Right. Uh, and, and were you going to multiple banks at that time to, to raise the capital? No, we were a public company. And the beauty of a public company is you just uh, issue shares to acquire businesses. Um, I've always, in my later stages of life, I've always looked back uh, with envy of the days when you can just issue equity to acquire businesses rather than get into debt. It's surely the best way of of uh, expanding rather than organic, which is very expensive. And when were you? When did you go public? It was already a public company, but my father had right. never issued one solitary share, had done any deal whatsoever, and it was a real sleepy company. Was it AIM or full listing? It was a full listing. In those days, you didn't have to be that big. Right. Because running a public company is quite expensive, especially if you, if you weren't making huge amounts of money. Yeah, it was, but there's a lot of public companies that are pretty dormant and no, nothing goes on they've been public for a long time and uh, they, they, they just did nothing happens so once you got Samuels yeah did you, did you have the taste of blood absolutely uh, because we turned uh, H Samuels profits of four million which was pathetic for a business of that size uh, in one year to 70 million profit because uh, in retail if you change the product then you get your increase in sales very, very quickly. And the fact that we had those fixed overheads and we got all that extra turnover, it went straight through to the bottom line. So it was was, uh, hugely successful. And then the city were on my side. They said, where's your next deal? 
um, because our shares had gone up from 30p to four pounds. And they, and they were shifting. They, they were waiting, you know, they were getting very excited and, you know, felt that there was a great opportunity, which they were right. So the only limiter for you at that point was if you can acquire a business, can you import your management leadership style? Can you drive that change? And where do you find these buggers from? Because, you know, that's... well, yeah, there weren't many. I mean, the next one was Ernest Jones, uh, which was a slightly more upmarket. Uh, operation but again it was a family that owned 50 percent and again i persuaded them to come on board and again i fired them so you know and in the end as you know i got fired so you know was, everything comes yeah, around it goes comes, around comes around but that was the only way of acquiring them of uh, of these businesses to be honest if you if they own over 50 percent you're not going to do it you're not going to have a contested uh, bid um you're going to have to have an agreement with them. So uh, that was the only the only way to do it. And did did it um, did you enjoy having the multiple brand strategy? Did it give you options? Or, did, or did you, were people shopping around, but they're going to four shops, each of which you owned? Yeah, we didn't want the public to necessarily know that. Uh, but the idea was that we would have Watch the Switzerland at the very top end and then divide... The market into three segments, which was Ratner's at the bottom, Samuel's in the middle, and Ernest Jones at the top. To get, because the jewellery market, the big problem that I had <clears throat> was the jewellery market was not big enough for our expansion. So, but to get at least 50%, we needed to split it three ways. So we were aiming at all areas of the market. And uh, what triggered you going across the pond? Well, the, exactly that is the fact that we'd run out of expansion. We either had to diversify out of jewellery uh, or, or move abroad because the shareholders, and if you're a public company, this is the mistake in a way, you don't run the company for yourself, you run it for the shareholders. And the shareholders were saying, well, you're ex-growth because you've got 50% of the jewellery market. Uh, so we've got the law of diminishing returns. You're not going to expand at the rate you have done. Yeah. Um, so the first one I went to was Tiffany's, um, and they turned me down. They said, well, we, if you forced us to sell, we would leave. I said, well, that's fine. But in the end, they, uh, they didn't agree, which is a bit of a shame because today it's a £19 billion pound, uh, company. But I went for – and the city didn't like the Tiffany deal because they felt – it was too expensive. You know, they were too upmarket. Total, uh, totally different market. Totally different market, yeah. So I then, f in America, um, you can, everybody is very open, unlike the UK. We're all defensive here and we don't want to tell anything. We're like the police, you know. Oh, no, we can't say this, we can't say that. So, but in America, everyone's very open. You go to a mall and uh, you ask the mall owner what the figures are. And they would tell you what the figures are of all the jewellers because they had to pay a percentage of sales, unlike a straight rent. And in every mall that I went to, uh, it was a company called Sterling that were taking the most money. And they did this before the internet by actually, we talk a lot about an algorithms now, you know your customer, which is the most important. They knew their customer. They had all the information on customers uh, with their computers, even though there was no internet. And they would phone up somebody and said, gee, did you know it's your uncle's birthday next week and we've got a very nice signet ring, which he would love, oh and God. we have just, uh, you have enough headroom on your in-store credit card to be able to afford it. And believe it or not, they say, gee, that's great news and buy it. I mean, that's where I'm explaining to you the difference between the UK market and America. If you do that in the UK, they'll just slam the phone down on you, but Americans yeah, are receptive. That's so far ahead of... of so far ahead of their time. Yeah. Because amazing. if you look at Amazon now with their now algorithms and they know everything, about, which yeah. is so important because you're, you're home and dry if you know what your customer wants. No, exactly. But these guys knew... Uh, and it was no thanks to me. I just discovered this. They knew what the customer wants before the internet. That's amazing. It was amazing. And they are today a business. People say, oh, you know, what happened to Ratners? Well, it's a 12 billion pound company. It's, it's thrived enormously uh, since I, in America since I left. The UK has not thrived, but America has thrived. Um, so at that time, you've been courted and talked about a lot. You've got loads and loads of column inches. Yeah. Um, is it, is, should, we, should we talk about... Should, should we talk? It's taken you uh, 
but I haven't got a watch. Well, I'm really interested. I, yeah. I, I, I know watches is Switzerland, mate. You get a lovely watch there. Yeah, um, I, I try it. We don't want to wear watches. Well, that's another one that is uh, one of my old companies that they floated separately, and they're a six billion pound company. All these companies, you know, have uh, a huge today. We definitely have the Midas touch. Well, unfortunately, I don't have any shares in them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it was the Royal Albert Hall, was it not? Yeah. Um, and what were you doing there? Because I, I remember you said in Ibiza that you always wanted to do a bit of stand-up and yeah. everybody else was really dull but who were talking that day. Well, it was President de Klerk of South Africa who made a very important speech because he ended apartheid. Um, and he was talking about how he wanted his cricketers to throw their fast balls at us, our batsmen, bouncers and stuff, quite aggressive. Uh, so it was a very, very important speech, but it wasn't President de Klerk that they talked about in the press the next day. It was uh, yours truly. And, the, and there was also Norman Lamont, the Chancellor of the Exchequer. So it was a big event um, at the Albert Hall, as you say, the Institute of Directors annual conference. And I was very honoured to be asked uh, in fact, when I turned up, they said, come to gate 13. And there was a whole reception committee, including somebody from the royal family. Um, not anyone of, re related to you. but um, <coughs> And I, I thought, oh, God, this is ridiculous. But apparently I'd arrived too early, and this was for President de Clark, the President de Clark, the royal reception. Oh, you thought it was all for you. I thought it was for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I was shaking hands with them and chatting. <laughs> And they go, get out of back there, you know. But uh, that, so it started quite badly and ended even worse. So um, did, do, do you want to explain what happened? Well, let me put it in your words. Yeah, I mean, I spent a lot of time preparing the speech because I was quite nervous about it. And it was 6,000 people at the Albert Hall and it was televised and all the press were there. And you had to give a copy of your speech in advance to the press. Um, so all the people that said I said this behind my customer's back is just rubbish. Like I gave a copy to, of the speech to the press. And you don't do something behind people's back at the Arbor Hall anyway, 6,000 people. But anyway, uh, it was a very serious speech. But then one of my co-directors, because I'd sent a draft of the speech to all the directors. And this was my mistake, because I was always very autocratic, which is not a good thing. But I was, and I always did things without consulting. But because this was a big event, I consulted, which is what I regret to this day. Because one of the directors came in, and I'm not blaming him because he could never have known what would happen, but he said, it's lacking jokes, it's got no jokes. So I said, well, the joke that always works is the prawn sandwich joke, where we sell a pair of earrings for 99p, same price as Marks and Spencer's prawn sandwich, but the sandwich probably lasts longer than the earrings. And if I'd have left it at that, I probably would have got away with it. But the other joke, which I'd used, and it had been reported in the press, so I thought Clarence. there was no danger, was the uh, sherry decanter, yeah. Uh, how can we sell that for such a low price? Because it's total crap. So uh, <laughs> that was put in at the last minute. It's still funny, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad you find it funny. <laughs> in, fact, in fact, people come up to me, and the only people who come up to me and think that they're very surprised about all well, this is the people that were actually there at the Albert Hall. They said they thought nothing untoward about it. But anyway, the Daily Mirror uh, was the paper that had decided to go to town on this. And of course, being disingenuous as the tabloids press are, uh, which you know your oh, yeah. experience, uh, they said that I said all my jewellery's crap, which I should never have said anything's crap. But in fact, that. I didn't say that jewellery... In fact, I said that all our jewellery is high quality. It sounds unbelievable that in that speech is that's what I said, but you can see it on YouTube. Uh, but I did say that show decanter was crap. And it's supposed to be... It was just a tongue-in-cheek, self-deprecating joke. But when you read it in the mirror, and then the sun changed their headline, uh, so they joined in as well. Uh, if you read it, it did look really bad. And the result of that? was absolute carnage. So I remember um, you mentioned that um, it was quite difficult getting hold of a bank manager, but when... when, when, <laughs> when, when so you see when, the funny side of all these when, disasters. When, when, you, when <laughs> you owe them a billion pounds, yeah. they generally pick up. <laughs> yeah, well, this is the thing that I do in my speeches at your event, which you kindly asked me to do in Albita, that um, th things going wrong bad is much funnier than good you know if I'd have stood up at your speech and said uh, in Ibiza and said you know 
I had a billion pound in the bank, it wouldn't be funny, but the fact that I owed a billion pound and the bank manager, and it wasn't the bank manager who phoned me up, it was the chief executive of Barclays Bank. <laughs> so, you know, that's one of the advantages of owning the bank a billion pound, you don't have to deal with your local manager. And he phoned me up, uh, and I said the most stupid thing of all time. I said, is it about the billion? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, yes. Uh, so that was it. Yeah, I owed the bank a billion pounds, uh, which was, as I said at the speech, was a lot of money in those days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the footballer's wage now. Yes, exactly, exactly. And um, there, there is a serious side to that because, you know, it, it did take its toll on you. Um, it did, it did. Um, I lost my job, but more importantly, a lot of my staff, young people who I'd given a chance to, uh, who said at the age of 23 was never would be running a jewellery shop, and they were so proud, and they lost their jobs. So you were talking about punching people in the nose because you've got a boxer yeah. uh, coming on. And I would like to punch the uh, journalist in the Daily Mirror who apparently wrote the story because I'd sacked his niece and he was said he was going to get his own back on oh. me. Uh, I never had the pleasure of meeting his niece. Of I never knew that she'd been sacked, but anyway. Um, so, yeah, it had a very bad effect on me. I went, I had a bit of a, uh, well, I gave up, basically. I, I lay in bed for seven years watching Countdown uh, on, on Prozac and uh, just didn't want to play anymore. Until the boss got involved. Until the boss got involved um, and uh, she kicked me out, basically. Um, she said that... Uh, you're lying in bed, we've got debts. Uh, you know, you're not making any effort to get back on your feet. I love the bounce back story. Yeah, well, thanks to her. Uh, and it was through health, uh, it was through cycling, because I got out and I told her that I was looking for a job, but I wasn't, I was just cycling around. But there was, a, but strangely enough, it was that cycling on a really good road bike. I know you might think that's irrelevant, but it's not because I wouldn't have cycled all that time on some lousy mountain bike. It was a really beautiful carbon fiber road bike. And I was cycling up hills and I was cycling. And I was thinking clearly, and I still do now. I cycle 25 miles a day and I get my best I'll ideas. You've got a nice raffer jacket on today as well. Yeah, exactly. You notice, yeah. I, I love cycling and um, I, I, I felt it was 1997, everyone talks about the benefits of health and fitness, but I felt um, strongly that I wanted to open up a health club because I could see uh, what it was helping me. And this would kill two birds with one stone. I would do what I love and please my wife and make some money. But I didn't have any money to, um, to start the club, but I, I blagged my way into getting people to believe that I had bought the club when I hadn't. So I put it into solicitor's hands and put an advert in the paper saying that this club was opening, um, which was a ridiculous thing to say because I had no way of completing it with the solicitors. And no way of paying. It was three quarters of a million pounds. I didn't have three quarters of a million pounds. I had debt of about a million. So anyway, I, uh, I got loads of members to sign up for this non-existent club. And uh, it went very well, and I sold it for four million pounds two and a half years later. So how many banks did you need to knock on the door of? I needed to knock on the door of 13 banks. The first 12 turned me down. And in fact, the 13th bank manager only... Uh, <laughs> only said yes, because his wife had signed exactly. up for a non-existent He's got a good memory. Club. Exactly. And he, his wife would be very annoyed if um, <laughs> it didn't. didn't go ahead. And I wrote, and then I did an article in the Sunday Times magazine about the club to promote it and I told them this story about the bank manager and it really pissed him off big oh. time and he's because I said why is it pissed? he says because people are coming up to me and saying is it all right with your wife if we lend this company the money and stuff like that it really gave him a hard time about it oh, he I was generally that. upset but, but then I gave his daughter a job and that was all right <laughs> <laughs> your things go around <laughs> exactly. in circles 
It's main sponsor time. So a massive shout out to Kingsbridge Insurance Group and specifically Elements. This truly unique and brilliant one place, one solution, staffing and compliance reliance tool is making a massive difference. It's a way to reduce your business op costs and fund some very questionable and random life choices. Our CEOs are all using it for a reason you should do. I would love to talk to you about your, the mentoring stuff that you're doing now. Yeah. Well, I'd like to talk about that because I would like to plug it. Yeah. But that, that's, mm. that's my quid pro quo <laughs> to you, buddy. Mm. Brilliant. Oh, so we didn't do a cheers. Cheers. Oh, cheers. Cheers, cheers, cheers. Cheers. cheers for that story because cheers. Cause your story is legendary. And it's, it's even a word. I, I'm not sure yeah. if it's in the Oxford It is. It is a word. But, yeah. But, um, yeah. I, I, Somebody I, does a retinue every week. I did something really random, and um, my uh, my business partner phoned me up and goes, "Hello, okay. is that Gerald Ratner?" Yeah. Because I don't know how you're going to get out of this one. Girl. <laughs> <laughs> so. No, it happens every day on Twitter. I've just had a huge amount of abuse over the Nigel Farage coots thing, and in fact, I said that if I had a hundred pounds for every time somebody's compared, you know, what they've done to doing a Ratner, I'd be able to open a coots account. <laughs> <laughs> With the, they could shut my accounts as well. So, they? Yeah. So uh, was that because you fell below a million quid? It, um, the, yeah, <laughs> they, they did say something like that, yeah. but it hundred percent wasn't. The, no. the, the timing was based on something else. Right. Entirely. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah big bad publicity. Big bad publicity, and they yeah. just basically turned you off. So it's the Queen's Bank. Well, this is the place that Nigel Farage does. He, he is, actually he asked me it. to do his. Uh, an interview, uh, which I am not doing, but I would do one for you. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> uh, but the thing is that um, I, I, as I say, I disagree with with Nigel Farage's policies and all that sort of stuff and his view. But a hundred percent sympathetic with him over that. Shall we mm. talk about this um, mentoring? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, because, sorry, yeah, that's yeah, what I was going to Because I think that's uh, this is what we do. Right. The, the, so the whole concept of us is like um, mates having a pint in a pub. Right. So we're allowed to go on tangents. The, okay. The, the rules are... I, I got a bad habit. Too. So what happened was that I somebody told me about this guy who was giving advice to women who just got divorced and they were paying $500 a month and they would get financial, legal advice and help because when women, and I don't want to sound unfeminist here, but it is a fact, you know, if they've gone through a divorce and their husband has looked after all the finances and all of that sort of stuff, uh, they are left in a difficult situation. So he has tuned in on this very cleverly. In fact, it was his wife's idea. And this is in America. And he, believe it or not, is grossing $7 million a month from this. That's how many members he's got just unbelievable because this is the way we are now people since the pandemic you know people are using zoom all the time and getting advice and getting mentoring and stuff like that it's a boom it's a boom industry so i could do with seven million dollars a month so i thought i'd start this up with call it joe right now and friends you'd only waste it <laughs> exactly exactly well, well i did have seven i didn't ever have seven million about i had about a, i had a salary of a million a year not seven million and that was uh, wasted so you're right so I certainly would waste seven million. Uh, anyway, so I, my wife again during the pandemic was saying she was starting up again. She says you're not doing your speeches and stuff like that. Um, why don't you do something else, another stream of income? So I started this uh, this idea because I saw this this law giving advice. So I thought I'd do my mentoring. I was already doing quite a lot of mentoring. Uh, I was going to the Cayman Islands and Dubai and stuff like that with different companies doing mentoring. So I thought I'd start a club. Uh, so the beauty of nowadays, you can start, as you know, you can promote something free of charge on LinkedIn. And I did all that. And uh, I didn't get seven million a month, but I got quite a lot of people. And uh, it was, as I said, it's called Joe Ratner and Friends. And every, uh, and I've done it because I'm not good at organising things uh i've got a partner who does all that natalie who's great um but i accused her of doing a ratner the other day because she criticized our members for not even though they're paying every month they don't turn up on zoom they, they give their apologies and she says we go to all this trouble and you don't you decide not to turn up and a lot of members got really annoyed about this so i've learned my lesson now you don't. You're very careful about insulting people. 
you don't bite the golden hand that feeds you. Well, um, welcome to my world. <laughs> so um, it's herding pigeons. Uh, that the guys yeah. we put on events. Yes, and then something else will take precedence. And I understand that because it's the nature of business. Yes, but if everybody invests in their staff, so L and D is something that they do for everybody else, and it's almost on pain of death that, that everyone has to attend, and we're we're spending big money on this. Yeah. They very seldom invest money in the, themselves and they become very isolated. So having in a community where you can ask questions, interesting to know what's the biggest issue currently. So what are the things that people frequently are talking to you about? Is it the economy? Is it what's happening next? How do I scale? How do I raise some capital? What, what's the hot The topic? strange thing is... And I'm supposed to be there to encourage them to make money in their business. But I'm ending up doing the opposite because the answer to your question is, how can I balance my life with the stress that I've got now? And I don't know whether, we've always had this stress. Things have always been difficult. So I don't know what this epidemic is about. Oh, I love but, you dearly because I 100% agree with you. Yeah, I don't know. You know, life is difficult. It always has been. Business is difficult. It's the, the joy of being your own boss is you can choose which 80 hours of the week you work. Well, yeah, that I, I I basically am a lazy person. I don't get up at the crack of dawn and work long hours and stuff like that. Um, but, yeah, so they are worried that they're making money and they're not happy with it they want a life that is making less money and uh having more leisure time more time with their families and stuff like that how do they balance up you can't be a part-time entrepreneur you're either all in that's 100 percent, or you're all out that's 100 so, so I, I mean when i built my business i was obsessed i had tunnel vision everything went by the way the way so including my first marriage four wives yeah <laughs> yeah you beat me on that but you know obsessive uh, and, and you're right, you have to commit, which is not healthy. It doesn't make you happy either, but it's oh, its know. root to success. I, I, th I think it makes me happier. If I achieve something that day, yeah. I come home, I'm in a happier mood around my daughter, my wife. So actually my work-life balance is getting success because that makes me a happier person. Whereas if I'm stressed and I'm not getting success, then I'm a nightmare. Yes, that's true. But I'm a nightmare either way because if I'm stressed, I'm a nightmare. But if business is going really well... Uh, you want more. I, I want more. I go home and I'm not... I'm physically sitting there with my wife and kids, but I'm not mentally there. I'm still thinking about how the business is going. And it's so exciting, uh, the things that were going on when I was building the, the Ratness Group, that it was a bit of a come down. It sounds a terrible thing to say, but it was a bit dull coming home. And that that, that was the problem. It, um, it's quite interesting. We've been, you know Dean... As well. Yeah, Dean, sure. So, so Dean was talking about the day he sold his business is the poorest he ever felt. And yes. somebody else has spoken recently that when he sold his business, he said it's all well and good being the parents' um, sort of sports day at yes. school. And when you say you, you're, you run a recruitment company, you don't expect pat on the backs and we're no. all good saving the society. Yeah. But when you had sold your company and not knowing who you were, he said it was dis destroying and it, um, mentally just broke him. So... Um, breakdowns yeah. just for and loads of naught zeros in the bank didn't didn't make no, up for that. No, and I've learned. I I'm now happier. I know I don't look happy. That's my face, but I'm happier uh, with with less money because uh, it's all about. And this is what I tell the people that I'm mentoring. It's all about actually ap appreciating uh, what you have got. And if if you've got billions. And you don't appreciate it, it doesn't make you happy. Well, also, I think it's wrong. If you're the boss and you're not the happiest person in the room, yes. why should anyone come work for you? Because all they're trying to do is hang on to that, your shirt tails. Because yeah. working in that environment, they, you've got to be able to eyeball the boss and say, by working here, you will make me more successful. And if that isn't the case, go and start up. Yeah, but everyone likes working for a successful company. They see if you're the boss and you're very successful, they're going to be successful. A bit of it rubs off on them. And then to a certain degree, they're sure. right. Yeah. Um, I think that's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. Should we have some fun now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. A huge thank you for all of the support from Corporate Peaks. Now, 
If you want to maximise how you incentivise, you have to phone these people. Business-related events, lunches, conferences and fun trips. From snow and black runs to tequilas and after sun, they just do it better. Yeah. I didn't know Jazz. you could dance. Alphabet soup. <laughs> I can dance. I've got moves. I can't. So, Jamesy. So, so, sir, give this a good yeah. old spin. Be, do, be Debbie McGee. V. V. Very interesting. Oh, okay, we can cram those yeah. into a V. Right, so V is right. going to be our chosen word. Here we go. Perfect, the book. So this... <laughs> <laughs> Knock it oh, over. Brilliant, well done, you. <laughs> One job takes the place out. <laughs> S-T-U-V. Here we go. Right, so, so the gig is... Yeah. Because I'm writing a book and it's based on different letters of okay. called alphabet soup so I'm plugging my own stuff on the Good other show. right so T U V here we go so we can do unless there's anything else you want to talk about we put U and V together because they weren't very um, <laughs> yeah very yeah much. right so we can do ups and downs but I think we've probably talked about that a lot of those unfair advantages so <clears throat> if you're in business how do you give yourself an unfair advantage well, you, or hmm. we can talk about value, adding value, because what you did is basically stack it higher, sell it cheap. Um, whereas my, old, my governor used to say, stack it higher, sell it dear, if you can, if you can possibly get away with it. Or we could potentially talk about vulnerability, about having a work mask or being someone that you're not always at work or how do you present yourself, what the natural person is within yourself. Or is there anything else you want to talk about? Well, you talk about unfair advantage and not being on a playing on a level playing field. Yeah. And there's a lot of truth in that in business. <clears throat> because uh, when I started, well, after I uh, sold my health club for £4 million, I put in £2 million into launching an online jewellery business. People said, how can you go back in the jewellery business? But I could see that all this bad publicity was actually working, believe it or not, to my advantage in a way because I got a lot of people knowing about the health club because of my uh, infamy, if you like, and I did the same online. Uh, but when I started online, uh, marketing costs were only about 2 or 3%. They're now 25% uh, because so many people are online selling jewellery. But they are... So it's 25% of your turnover or your net fee? 25% of your turnover, so if you sold an eternity ring, it's ridiculous. It's un it, everyone says the internet's a panacea, but and it's much cheaper than having a shop, but it isn't, in fact, because Google are charging 25% uh, per pay per clicks. So we were selling an eternity ring for or £400, making a profit of £200, but we were paying Google £190 uh, to sell the bloody thing. So where, where it's, when we started, it was only like two or three pounds because there wasn't the competition. But the big players are not paying anything because they don't have to. Amazon right. don't have to go on Google uh, search or be on the front page because you they're a destination you go to, as yeah. as eBay, as are the big players. And this reminds me of when I took a shop in a shopping mall and... I had to pay a premium to uh, when we were small uh, to go into that shopping centre. But the Marks and Spencers of this world were actually paid a reverse premium. To be there. To be there. Yeah. So as an anchor tenant in Meadowhall, for instance, Marks and Spencers, I found out, were paid £9 million, to, which was a lot of money in those days, uh, um, to be the anchor tenant. So they were being paid whilst I was having to pay. So you're not competing on a level playing field, no. just like you're not on the internet. So the answer is, you have to be big, and then you you can't go wrong, but if you're small, you're always going to be crushed. So um, we, we were talking about the high street um, at, just before we came on yeah. there, and um, Marks and Spencers, interestingly enough, have put in planning application to redo that whole Oxford Street store. Yep. And got refused. Now, yeah. I don't know why it's been refused. I think because it's a historical building or something or other, which it isn't. It's an ugly building. It's really ugly. It's like yeah. a proper I 70s know. prefab. I know. I know. Um, it doesn't make any sense when you've got no. 
what could be their proper showcase. And it's a big old foot. foot yeah, foot. but they are going to turn a lot of the upper parts into, uh, as a lot of people are doing. Flat. Yeah. Resi. Mm. What do you think about the future of the, the high street? Well, just walking down Oxford Street to get here depressing. is depressing. And, and it's not only the empty shops, it's the quality of the shops that are there. It's like market traders selling rubbish. I, mean, I shouldn't say something like that because <laughs> you've got form. <laughs> you've got form in that area. I don't know. I should, but the fact is that um, the stuff that is really happening that's going on is happening on online. And this is like the reserves. This is like second rate in comparison. And when that happens, uh, there's only one way it's going to go and it's going to go worse. Because if you've got a shop in a, in a town... It's your neighbours that bring you success. When we had, a, I once phoned up a manager because we were doing extremely well. I said, why has sales gone up so much? And he says, because we've had a, this fashion retailer move next door. In fact, it was Next uh, with one of their first shops. Uh, and as soon as Next started, they flew, they took off. Everyone loved it. George Davis. Is George Davis, the greatest, history. greatest retailer of all time, because he did... Shut up. He is, because he started next, he started Per Uno, and he started Georgia Asda. I mean, many most people don't start one, he started three. He's a real retailer who knows his business. It was the first business book I ever read, and I read it about 50 times. And yeah. I thought he was, I just thought he was, really, he was a genius. Well, funny enough, I phoned him up about a month ago. Oh, and he, sorry. He's You're dropping names. I'll pick them up. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was, the worst thing you could ever do is drop names, but um, I didn't think we were dropping his name. No, it's, anyway, it's so, and he was uh, out, and he's older than me, and he was out looking at, his secretary said he's out looking at cloth in Austria because he is... He likes a touchy feel. He knows but his so, product. You know. See, I, see, I think that's the thing. It's, um, you, there's lots of things you can buy on the internet, yeah. but I don't think you can buy a schmutter because you want to feel the quality of it because you really don't know what it's you're getting. It's touchy-feely. It is touchy-feely, yeah. but maybe there's a, a certain point. But on both ends of Oxford Street, you've got a Primani, uh, and, they're, and they're, they're, they're really big old shops. It just shows you that you don't always have to do what everybody else does. To not have, if, if you, somebody told you that they've got a fashion retail and they are not got an online presence, you'd think they're completely nuts. Exactly. But it works. So. And Zara, so it's their just in time, isn't it? So they, they basically, if you see an item, you have to buy it because there's a chance that I'll never be in the shop again. Well, every, this is a great selling technique. Last hurry, last three and stuff. It's complete bollocks. <laughs> I mean... I, I ordered something. I'd already signed up. Sorry. I already bought something on Amazon because they said it was the last two. So I bought it and I went back to check and it was still the last two. So it's rubbish. But it's a great selling technique. Cause, well, well, you did it first with the big signs. We did it windows. all the time. We, what we did is we had a sale and it, we had a countdown to the end of the sale and we went last eight days, last seven days. And we had a countdown, got built a whole lot of stuff. And then when it finished, we said, due to popular demand, we're extending the sale. So, I mean, unless, you have to be a bit cheeky, otherwise you're not going to get anywhere. 100%. Yeah. And being memorable, which yeah. we were talking about. I yeah. love that. He's good, isn't he? Huge thank you to RDLC for chipping in and supporting me on this private adventure. Um, it is the only place to be. There are other recruitment networks, but frankly, they're shit. Uh, always work with the RDLC. It's a better place to be. Hang out with 300 recruitment CEOs. It's the board you can't afford. Peace. Right, which, where should we go? Go to the island. <sighs> We're going to go to an island. Yeah, right. Right. Look, now you, this, yes. is where, this is where you have to work out. Okay. Good luck. Thank you. So, so the concept is, it's actually it's a really rubbish concept. Yes. Um, it's, I wanted to ask you that you could have one of everything. So I just thought, well, we're yeah. going to be on a desert island. Um, and it's like one book to read, one mantra and stuff like that. So it doesn't really work. Mm. But do you know what? There's a great sound effect. So um, uh, I will give you one wish, Gerald. What, what would it be? One wish uh, that I could have anything? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't want to sound sort of cheesy, but it would be health for my family and happiness for my family. 
Um, that's the most important thing to me, my children. You mention health and, and yes. well-being a lot. Well, because a lot of journal people... and stuff like that. Are you sort of aware of modern techers on how to, to keep mind and soul? No. But what I do do is when I'm cycling my 25 miles every day, I think at my age, 73, I'm much better sitting on that bike than sitting in an office, even though I'm not making any money. Um, because I'm realising now a lot of my friends, sadly, have had problems, strokes things like that, which I believe that cycling stops you getting, or exercise generally stops you getting. I know everybody says that, but it's true. And it's especially true as you get older. And you do the same 25 miles every day? No, I'm not that anal. I, uh, I've got about four different routes. But what I do do is make sure they've got some very steep hills. And I always feel that uh, I'm happier cycling uphill than cycling downhill. That's a metaphor, if, if you like. Oh, you you like, like the struggle and not the ride. You get a lot of benefit. You get your endorphins, and if you're going uphill, uh, you get a lot of ple- much more pleasure than going down. Although, uh, when I was a kid... You could just get a shittier bike and make it more of a challenge. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't <laughs> thought of that. I, but you, it comes... The beauty is if you, you you want the comfort as well and you've got that with carbon fibre. But when I was eight years old, I used to go down a hill and crash the whole time into a bush because there was at the bottom of the hill was a sharp bend. And my mother said, why do you keep going down that hill when you know you're going to end up crashing at the end of the thing? I said, because of the exhilaration, the excitement of going down the hill, it's worth it. And that is a bit like how I've behaved in, in this life. You know, you, knowing I, it's going to end in tears, I, I but enjoying the ride. I think you've enjoyed, you're enjoying the journey of life. Exactly. So I even though you know you've got this sort of Damocles hanging over you, you don't care. Uh, yeah, you can't care. And you've no. got still got a spark in your eye. Uh, one prediction. Well, I don't make predictions because every single prediction uh, that you always hear turns out to be incorrect. The one thing I have learned if I've learned one thing in life is that you cannot predict the future because it always turns out totally differently. Okay, can you ever you work with, with um, UBS for me, please? Because <laughs> they seem to be guaranteeing me a future. And it yeah, and they're happens. always wrong. They're always wrong. They're always wrong. That's why I'm very sceptical about this whole green thing that the world's going to come to an end. The only reason, I don't know the first thing about it, the only reason I think that it could not be true is because everybody says it is true. <laughs> Because everybody's always wrong. We're, we're learning more about you yeah. from this than everything right. else. Brilliant. Uh, the best moment that you've ever had. So I'm going um, to I'm going to make it about business. Was there one okay. moment when something happened to you? And, nice. Yeah, it was because uh, when I acquired H Samuel, because it went from 150 shops to 600 shops overnight. But it put me in the big league, uh, and I know that sounds like a bit sort of. Uh, Egotistical. No, that's but, fine. But You're in good company here. I, I was in the small league, and it was like a football team that's been promoted to the Premier League. It was a huge quantum leap, and suddenly people were taking... And I'd been struggling for 20 years in the family business, going nowhere, spending my time in the betting shop, giving up. And I'd suddenly now landed on my feet, and I was... I had 600 shops... And I had H. Samuel, and uh, it was incredibly Were exciting. your parents around to so see you do that? My parents are around. They're very proud. My wife wasn't decided not to be around and divorced me at exactly the same time. Um, you were focused. <laughs> that, I think that's it. In fairness to her, I was focused on H. Samuel on this acquisition, not on the not on home, on the relationship. Because as I said, uh, when my wife, my second wife said that, she was going to throw me out because I was always at home. My first wife threw me out because I was never at home. Women. Yeah, I know. Can't live with them. You leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I do love the fact that your parents were being really proud about that. They so, were. Yeah, so they were. That, that's massive. A massive thank you and shout out to Target Recruits, the number one Salesforce-based recruitment-centric CRM. Now, they are the ultimate single moment of truth for aspirational business leaders in recruitment. If you're not aspirational, I wouldn't bother. Uh, here's a random one for you. That's yeah. 73. So you have to have a tattoo this afternoon. We're going to have a tattoo. What would you have a tattoo of? I know you've got a tattoo on your yeah, arm. Tattoo. Uh, 
I'm not a fan of tattoos. I promise. Yours actually works quite well, but I, uh, I don't wouldn't like. Uh, but I am an Arsenal supporter, um, and there was a player called We've got second place. <laughs> second place. <laughs> no, they. Uh, I just wouldn't have a tattoo. Sorry, I, I know you're don't. forcing me to have one, but I'm not yeah. going to have one. I don't I, like them. Right. I can't see the point of them. Why is everyone having our tattoos? They do nothing. Anyway, yours makes you look younger. <laughs> it makes you look hip. You know, makes you look. You, you know, if you've got Sweet. a. Yeah, we're you still, don't that's have the hair. You don't have an old dinosaur like me with a tattoo. You know, you're do like 25 think. years younger than me. Uh, what do you um, what do you call a blind dinosaur? <laughs> no, I don't know. Do you think he saw us? <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> Even worse that, than that my jokes. Blue. Right. Um, one do over. So something that you could change of the past. Well, that is the most stupid question no, that you've asked you, all day. But actually, because that, in real well, times, you know. It's, it's, you're it's right. not being the killer of you. You've bounced back. You've probably changed. Um, you're famous. Well, that's true that uh, I wouldn't. There's a, if I was just a successful businessman, I wouldn't be well known. But because uh, unsuccessful, well, I'm very well known. Uh, and you can't say you're unsuccessful. Well, I, people, everyone else does. <laughs> I appreciate oh, no, that. I think, I think it, it, yeah. it, no, you're, you're up there with George. Well, uh, the fact is that... Uh, Somebody, I was at a speech and they said, well, Q&A's afterwards. I said, well, nobody ever wants to ask the same question. Would you ask the first question? And they said, what do you want me to ask? I said, do you regret saying what you said? So he stood up at the end. Nobody asked the question. He stood up and said, do you regret, Mr. Ratner, do you regret saying what you said? And I said, that's the most stupid question anybody's ever asked me. He says, but you planted it. I said, well, you don't supposed to tell them that. But the fact is that actually thinking about it, it's a bit unfair me saying it's a stupid question because I am got enough money, I'm happier, I appreciate things, I'm happily married for 33 years. I don't think that would have happened if I was still. Uh, and you're still here and, and living with that stress. And I'm healthier, I'm yeah. cycling. You can't cycle if you're running a public company 25 miles a day or go for an hour's walk with a dog. So, yes, it's not such a stupid question. Uh, so to your, the answer to your question is... Um, wouldn't be that. Wouldn't be that, no. A guilty pleasure? Well, I've got a very bad uh, addiction of smoking cigars, which falls back to the days when I could <laughs> afford it. Bloody dark. Yeah. I, I sit, when we moved into our new house, <clears throat> my wife says, you can't smoke that stinking thing in the house. You have to do it in the garden. I thought, oh, God, I can't stand it. But I love the peace of not being bothered, sitting at the end of the garden... At the end of the day, don't take my phone. I have total peace. Now, Cuban cigars, you sorry you asked me this. Cuban cigars have gone up in value to the point that when I used to smoke them, they were £10. They're now £60. Uh, that's in, nobody seems to talk about that when they're talking about inflation. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I certainly don't. Anyway, so I then had this brilliant idea of getting um, cheaper cigars from Nicaragua um, and they were like half 30. But then they went up in price, and I'm now on Honduras cigars. That's down to 15. So I don't know what I'll be on next, but I still smoke my cigars. That's brilliant. Yeah. Um, there's a cigar club here, actually. Oh, is there? Yeah. And uh, yeah, people, I generally have an old puff here You've and there. You've got to have, really uh, the only problem is a cigar doesn't taste anything unless you have a drink. <laughs> so oh. it's one bad thing adding to a next compounded. bad thing. So that is my guilty pleasure. Yeah, compound interest. Yeah. Uh, one sporting victory you wish you had had? What, a team that I support or, or me personally? So it could have been you winning the Tour de France or... Oh, me winning uh, the Tour de France, or, yeah. or it could be Arsenal winning Champions yeah. of Europe. Never happened. Well, they nearly did. <laughs> we got to the final. Uh, we, But you're right. Um, so, I don't know. I used to... Uh, play tennis or? I do play tennis I'm absolutely diabolical at tennis because I get so tense that I want to win that I just hit the ball in the net the whole time but I have a fantastic service everybody says that it never actually goes in but if it goes in Federer wouldn't be able to return it it is so fast but the trouble is it often goes out the court did you did you watch Wimbledon I did. Did you see the uh, boys' champion, who's a Brit, who's 17, who served yeah. at 134 miles an it. hour? 
I'm 17. That's, that that's faster than all, all the big boys. That, yeah, well, let's that's, hope that he goes somewhere because it is pathetic since Andy Murray that we never, we've got nobody even lasts a week at Wimbledon. No. It's pathetic. <laughs> Sad. So, yeah, it'd be nice to have a nice wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be Wimbledon nice? winner. Um, one person that, from history that you wish you could have met or someone who's around now that you wish you will meet? Well, you, this is going to make me very, very unpopular. And this, this is the one thing that people well, will, we've, will yeah, might we've, talk about this podcast. The only thing that they'll say is about who I'm about to say now. They won't say anything else about anything. Strapping. Yeah. Uh, so they say you shouldn't meet your heroes. So I would like to meet the worst person that ever lived on this world, Adolf Hitler, to understand how anybody could do what he did, to try and work out, uh, because it doesn't make any sense that somebody... Well, I suppose I'd like to learn... There's something terrifying about him that I still watch when I watch the document. I'm still terrified. It's really frightening. And uh, I'd, in a way, you like to be frightened. So that's why I'm probably addicted to watching these World War II things. It's something really terrifying. So I would like to meet him. I'm sorry. No, I'd like that's to meet it. Him to understand. But there, there's a reason why there's so much TV about shark attacks and, and uh, World War II and Hitler. That a lot of people watch it. No, you never stop. It's just like when I do my speeches, it's all bad stuff and people prefer it to good stuff. <laughs> and uh, you like uh, bad stuff. We'd like it. That's where we are. That's brilliant. Uh, I know the answer to this. One yeah. food that you could eat for the rest of your life. Well, it is sushi. Um, and what's and this restaurant? Yeah, you know? I'm reading about this restaurant that uh, Giles Curran wrote about in the Sunday Times, which is officially the most expensive restaurant, Japanese restaurant. It's most officially expensive. It's £426 a head. And this is now what they're doing now. There's a word for it. It should be called... Nuts. We, it, well, it, it should be, we've seen you coming, yeah. but it's it's £426 a head of set meal and you have lovely raw uh, sashimi, you have scallops. And so they don't even bother to cook it. It's not even cooked, <laughs> but it is so fresh and it's so beautifully made. You have this crab with a bit of caviar on the top. You have one little course after the other of raw fish. And I love sushi, as you saw today. I brought my Waitrose yes. <laughs> box of crappy sushi, uh, which I paid £7 for my lunch, rather than £426 yeah. for my lunch. Um, and didn't really enjoy it, because well, you can't eat supermarket sushi. If you get uh, loads more gigs out of this, yes. then, then, yes, then maybe we, to, we can go there We together. can go to that restaurant. But by the way, that doesn't include service, it doesn't include wine, so you're in for a grand, uh, plus, for two. And that who pays a thousand pounds for an effing meal? Uh, Let it go. I mean, Let who would pay? <laughs> yeah. I, however much that meal you'd enjoy, I'd leave that restaurant. I'd say, oh my God, I've lost a thousand pounds. Is that lawyer from America doing seven million dollars a month? He'd be fine with that. Yeah. Uh, one mantra in life that you kind of live by. Well, I once read a book called The Road Less Travelled, and the first line in the book was. Life is difficult. If you accept that, it's no longer difficult. So all the things that happen to me uh, that are difficult, and it happens to all of us, nobody sails through life without any setbacks. And you meet somebody who's sailed through life without any setbacks, and there's a lack of empathy and sympathy. To be part of the human race, you have to have suffered somewhat. And if you accept that life is difficult, then you don't beat yourself up over the things that go wrong. You think, well, this is par for the course. This is normal. I'm alive. This is living. Things are going to be shit. Things are going to go wrong. And things are going to go right. But, but you, have to, you cannot get too stressed out when things go wrong because that is where it's always been. That's life. Control the controllables. It's it. It is. It's normal. You know, it's, I mean, my sons, who I adore to the moon and back, his girlfriend dumped him and he's going through a terrible time but I'm thinking we've all done that that is life so I'm not that upset about it because the alternative is not being alive these are the things that happen so you cannot lie awake at night being yeah. annoyed about get it. him on the bike get going for a bike. Oh, he's, I've already got him on the bike and that actually this does help it does help him but she just dumped him uh, as women do <laughs> <laughs> Happens a lot. It does. I've been dumped a few times. Um, and lastly, 
a book to read. So is there a book that you just think is the best, best of books? Yeah, there's a book by uh, Rose Tremaine called Music and Silence, which is set in the 15th century, and it's the Danish royal family. And it tells you that is a particular subject that I have no interest in whatsoever, but it tells you something about books. It's got nothing to do with the subject. It's just how it's written. Because I like crime, and I I bought a book on crime, and it was absolute rubbish. It was a murder thing. It had all the ingredients that I loved, but it, it was just didn't work for me so often it's the book about a subject there was another one that i read by sarah waters about lesbians which is something if i knew it's about lesbians i wouldn't have read about it uh, but i loved it the be- way the book was written because it just was addictively beautifully written and it was just page turner so um yes yeah, rose tremaine is my favorite author because she writes about the craziest subjects but work it yeah. works. So um, I should ask you questions about lesbianism. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was of all things. This was lesbians' love affair. And if you ever would ask me something that I would not be interested in, was be that it's not that I've got anything against them. It's just not. I went to the theatre the other day, and I'm enjoying the thing. And suddenly, the two main men in it start kissing, and I think, oh. Why does everything always have to be about LGBT? You know, kind of just with the old-fashioned love affair thing. Anyway, I'm not going to go down that road because I get myself into trouble. There's gold in there. Unbelievable. You're not going to uh, really struggle to get a few snapshots from this one, are you? Uh, it's sound bites galore. Advice to your 18 year self? Yes. Well, the thing is that I very much believe that uh, I didn't go to university. Would be surprised. Did. I was actually, I can beat you on this, I was expelled from school through being stupid, from coming last. In those days, they could expel you for being stupid. Today, they'll say Sorry. you've got some... <laughs> this, today, they'll say you've got dyslexia or something. Today, they just said you're stupid. expelled from school because... I not for not trying, just for... Well, I didn't try, as it happens, but I came last out of 33. <laughs> and they would expel you for that. Wow. Well, Especially if I did it three times in a row, which I did. Oh. So... <laughs> But the thing that it helped me with, which I'm a firm believer, is that if you're in business, and I believe that you're the same, that you have to start at the bottom in a way to learn the ropes. And you see people coming out of university and they don't have any work ethic and they don't know how to deal with people. This is a problem with a lot of politicians like Rishi Sunak. They've never been there. They don't understand how the average person thinks and lives. I did it. I worked in the shop for years. I played football at Hackney Marshes with people who dug up the roads. I feel that that has done me a lot of good because I'm down to earth. I can relate with people. I can, when I talk to them, I can understand. I'm not in some ivory tower, uh, which doesn't help in business. It doesn't help in life. No. So I wouldn't change what, even though I made a complete F up of my life in the early days and in the later days as well. Um, I'd still feel that uh, it was important to me that I didn't, that I I started at the bottom and did a lot of job. My my first job was um, washing up, and that did me a lot of good. I I, I was talking to uh, filling cars with petrol on Whitton High Street, and then the second job uh, was working for you. Yeah, well, there you go. But, you know, I was talking to this chef. He says he'd rather have somebody in his company who started off putting the bins out at 2 o'clock in the morning than some person, some executive walking in with a degree. I think so. What's your opinion on uh, education? So are you degrees useful? I, I mean, think I'll, the problem... I'll prob- tell my doctor to have one. The problem that with what we've got at the moment is that our educational system treats everybody exactly the same way. There's a... What do you call it? A, a thing. Dumbing uh, down. Or- well, no, everything is exactly the same. Everyone learns the same subject, stuff like that. But the problem is that everyone's different. It's like if you go and have a haircut to somewhere and they cut everybody's hair in a certain way because it's fashionable. That will suit some people. It won't suit others. But the educational system is the same way. They give us the same uh, treatment. Uh, in, and somebody might become a great, be artistic. Music is just important in maths for certain, for certain people. But the trouble is that they don't take those subject particularly seriously but they should tailor things for for people but i mean i came unstuck because when i went to my first school there was only about eight 
people in the class and I learned a lot. I passed my 11 plus. But it was when I went to this big school and I just look, got lost with so many people in it. You know, I didn't, couldn't, I needed more one-to-one -one attention. Yeah, but the, I think it's very um, interesting when T Tallulah went through her uh, secondary school. Yeah. The first thing she did in the first term was they teach children how to learn. Yes. And I thought that was really cool because I was never taught how to learn. Well, manage myself, manage my time, manage exams. Yeah, um, yeah. And interestingly, she, she, latterly in life, she's 100% going to go down the route of doing something in psychology to change the way education works so that um, it's, it's more practical and it opens up to, to more people rather than just be memory-based. It's got to be practical. I mean, they don't teach you anything about money. I mean, is that more important than, you know, some of the subjects that That's, they learn? Um, Lila asked me what, I, um, what advice my 18-year-old self. Yes. Uh, save 50% of my commission every month. If I'd done that, yeah, you know, just the little thing like that. But, you know, I've got a tattoo that says spend and God will save. So well, my big problem is when I'm running companies, they always bring in money. I know how to bring in money, but it, because I'm running them, they go, the money's going out faster than it's coming in. That is my problem. Well, it's not a problem. You've done very well with that. Right. So, Gav, a quick uh, emergency question because you talk about finances and that will naturally lead on to wind farms, which I know puts you in a really awkward spot. So I'm saving you from yourself here, Gary. Yeah. Emergency question, anybody? Right, I've got emergency questions. Right, so um, we've got one to, one to 11 here. Okay. I cheat, by the way. So yeah. just, just be aware of that. So I, I do cheat. I thought you might. Yeah, I'll just... <coughs> um, um, give us a number between 1 and 11. 7. Brilliant. What is the most interesting thing that you've ever learned about the world? Well... Or that you didn't even blink. You went straight in with an answer. <laughs> this is good. Well, the funny thing is, um, it's quite terrifying. People never seem to focus on this. The population explosion. If you look at the numbers of the, how it's gone up uh, sevenfold in the last 30 or 40 years. It's incredible. So if that carries on, and never mind about the green issues, um, we are, our biggest problem is actually, the world is going to carry on. There's no problem with the world, in my view, with the global warming and I think, that's not a problem with the world. It's us, it's the population that's a problem because there's so many of us that it's actually there's going to be just too many people to fit to in feed. The, to, to feed. I mean, we've got this problem in the UK now. Well, it's 2.1, isn't it? The, our, um, we need 2.1 children per household to sustain, just right. sustain uh, the population as it is. Right. But there are other countries around who are basically still paying to have more children. So yeah. there's more people into the tax process, the yes. tax system, yes. to afford to do the things that they promised to do or pay the bills that our generation... So, I mean, it was going to be another five, six, seven generations before any of those bills were even yeah. remotely paid off. Yeah, but you can see the problem in this country. When I was a kid, we had a population of 50 million. Now it's 70 million, and it can't cope. The, the, the services don't cope. The NHS is a effing disaster. The police don't catch anybody. Uh, the schools are overcrowded. This is the problem we've got, but they multiply that by five if you're looking in a hundred years time um if i'm, I'm going totally off script yeah i think we should pay our, our our prime ministers and mps significantly more money to attract better quality people into those roles and we take more care about 100 percent agree 100 percent. the stupidity is we're always saying that you know they're they're overpaid or you know they're getting the right it is so for the prime minister alone i don't know what he earns 150,000, which is I mean, the woman who runs NatWest earns five million. Uh, I know who's more important. It's more important to me that we have a prime minister that does a good job uh, than, than anything else, actually. It's the most important job in the country. So I'd be very happy to pay the prime minister five million pounds. So and if, if the NatWest feel that they will get a better person or a football team will get a better person because they pay more, and you do get a better person. I don't care what anybody says. You get a better person if you pay more. We will get better politicians if we pay more. And that is the best investment we could ever have because it is, we've got rotten politicians that are leading us down the wrong path. We're in a mess because we don't have 
high calibre because we're not competitive, we don't pay. Because people won't go into politics because they won't earn as much. See that 25-year-old kid? Got yeah. So yeah. I'm not well, sure how I feel about that. He's come straight out of Oxford. He's got no experience at anything. Did, did, you, did you know that it's, I think it's 99% of our prime ministers have all gone to the same university? Yeah, I know. Which is were, just wrong. Absolutely, because you've got to have life experience yeah and it's got, got to be different okay well um another yeah. number oh four oh, what is your biggest fear and why these are all really heavy they are i don't have any fear i have no fear whatsoever when i go skiing i end up landing on my head i have accidents i don't have any fear i didn't have any fear in business people said to me why do you go to america where well, you've got a lovely successful business in the uk because they said if you fail in America, as every other retailer has, they'll turn on you with venom. Why are you going to America? I had no fear of doing that. I don't have fear. And I think it's important in business that you don't have fear. Because I'm, business I'm, is a gamble. I'm driven by fear of failure. But it's the thing that makes me work hard. So I, I basically try and take Absolutely. out the but Absolutely. But people say you shouldn't. Um, <laughs> which is your favourite child? My favourite child? Yeah. Well, I get accused of liking my son, which is not true. Oh, you don't like him at all? No, they, I, oh. they're accused of favouritism. Because <laughs> oh, yeah. I was the son, the only boy. Uh, no, I, I love them all equally. I think the best answer... What a ridiculous question. No, I can't not, answer. That's two ridiculous questions. Yeah. No, you can, because somebody actually said it depends. Uh, and it basically then makes them work really hard. Well... Funny enough, I talked to this guy, he's got four daughters and they're all incredible achievers. And I said, what's your secret? He says, I've just ignored them all all my life. Mm. Okay, what's your, yeah. <laughs> what's your favourite um, conspiracy theory of the moment? Because there's so many. Well, that is a difficult one. So are you all about the vapour trails and Bill Gates and um, being changing the weather? Oh. I think they're all rubbish. All these conspiracy theories all turn out to be what they are, conspiracy theory, total nonsense. Uh, so, you know, I don't accept these conspiracies. They're, they're, they're by people that got nothing else to do but put that on Facebook. It's just totally ridiculous. I don't know. Straight talker. There's, well, a, there, there, there's a reason they're called conspiracy theories, because they're not true. They're conspiracy. They can't, can't be proven by fact. No. Where, where are we, James Lee? Uh, Done. I don't um, can I just say that's been an absolute pleasure? Well, I love the fact that you don't sit on the fence. You've got stuff in there <laughs> which is absolutely golden. You're funny, boned, and it's always a joy. And I do appreciate the fact that you came to see me when you wouldn't go and see Nigel. I'm eating, I out. I'm eating out on that. And it's the oh, same yeah. venue, so it wasn't a bit No, like it's it. exactly the same <laughs> venue, but um, no. We gelled together in Ibiza. On a beach outside Nassau drinking beers. I beers. love it. Yeah, I did. And so when you asked... And by the way, I never do that. Uh, I don't. When somebody asks me, I do get asked to do podcasts. I turn them all down. To be honest with you, we're off air. I would... Uh, Rob Moore always quote... Oh, we're not quite off air. Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've made that mistake before. Uh, he always says, just charge 500 quid to get rid of the time wasters. Oh. Should I do? But annoyingly, they still go ahead with it. So you're the one person that I didn't charge. You know, I wouldn't charge because I know you and I like you. So right, you you're go. an absolute gent. Yeah. Um, so uh, as has been the case, we'll just give our guest the last word. Yeah, I so didn't realise that 500 quid was on air. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually five grand, but anyway. Yeah, uh, yeah. We, we can edit uh, around it. Don't, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> um, is there anything that you'd like me to ask of you just before we wrap up? Is there anything yes. else that you're doing? Um, are you still, I know you're still um, doing public speaking, yeah. which you are a yeah. world, a world class public speaker and the best one we've ever had. And the, 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 expen the extended story on, yeah. on your background is, is genius. You've got the um, um, advisory and mentoring piece which is going mm. on so people can find you at. Uh, well, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, I'm on LinkedIn. If they just uh, Google me, they get all that information. Brilliant. They get a lot of information. They, they do, me. yeah, yes. they do. Yes. You have to embrace it as much as uh, I hate it. I have to. You have to embrace it. So thank you very much for me, and I'll give you the last word. Well, I've thoroughly enjoyed today, and... Um, 
you've asked me some really good questions. And there's a couple of shit ones, apparently, as well. a couple of shit ones. <laughs> uh, but I think we covered everything, and I've really enjoyed your company. Brilliant. Brilliant. So, your little much. cheers, and uh, thank you, James, for putting that together for us. Yeah, Gerald, thank you very cheers. much. Cheers. Lovely cheers. to see you.